This video looks at Hadamard's lemma for smooth functions in one dimension and then in its n-dimensional form. It then goes on to look at how this lemma applies to smooth functions defined on some manifold. So Hadamard's lemma describes how any smooth real-valued function can be exactly expressed in a convenient polynomial-like form, really Taylor's series to first order. So Hadamard's lemma says that given some f that uh, belongs to the class of infinitely number of times differentiable functions on uh, n-dimensional space, that is a smooth real-valued function defined on an open star convex neighbourhood u of some point a equals a1 to an depending on the dimension you're in. So that's in n-dimensional Euclidean space. Then f of xi can for all xi equals these n-dimensional coordinates here, in u be expressed, this n tuple, sorry, in u can be expressed in the form, so this function in n-dimensional space, Euclidean space can be expressed in this form here, is f of ai, the point around which we're expanding, this time plus this object over here, where each gi also belongs to the class of infinitely number of times differentiable functions on Rn, and are smooth functions on the set u. So let's just move on here and have a look at a bit the idea of a star domain or star convex. So a set U in Euclidean space Rn, here it is, in Rn, um, it now is called a star domain or star convex if there exists some AI, uh, some point A in U for which a line joining some other arbitrary point X, X is any point there in U to A, lies wholly within U. So X could be anywhere in here. And so long as the line joining x to a is wholly within u, then it's star convex or a star domain. Let's have a look at the one dimensional case. Now imagine we have some function h which maps the closed interval 0 to 1 into the reals, where h of t is given by f of a plus t outside of x minus a, this object here. So here's the argument of f, all of this. Now, h of 1 minus h of 0, turns out this will be f of x minus f of a. So if you put h, t is 1 in here, because remember h is a function of t, so if we put t as 1 in here, then this a and this a will cancel out, and we're left with just f of x. And if we put t as 0 in here, t is 0 here, all of this disappears and we're left with just f of a. So that's one observation first off. And also the derivative of h with respect to time, dh dt, becomes df dx times d dt, or of this argument, so d dt of this argument, and that gives us, if you differentiate this, you'll end up with x minus a times df dx. Now the first fundamental theorem of calculus tells that h of 1 minus h of 0 is this integral, definite integral from 0 to 1 of h dash of t, derivative of h with respect to t, integrated with respect to t, which is this object here, uh, and we take this outside because there's no functional dependence on t here. We're integrating only other t, which is this part here. And we have f of x minus f of a. So that tells us that g of x is this definite integral with respect to t of this object here. And hence f of x is f of a plus x minus a times g of x. Okay, so that's in the one-dimensional case. If we take that now to the n-dimensional case, we have the same interval again, 0 to 1 h is a function of t, and here we go, but this time now we're in n-dimensional space, the i's will run from 1 up to n here, as we saw earlier, and t uh, times this object here, so the argument of f is this n number of variables in here. So in three dimensions we'd have x, y, and z here, and a1, a2, a3, and so on. Again, same thing, h of 1 minus h of 0 gives us this, and the derivative of h with respect to t gives us this object here. Just remember now this is a function of many variables. And this leaves us with the sum of these xi minus ai from i equals 1 to n times df dxi. Also from i equals 1 to n. And that means that this g subscript i here, this function here, um, each of these objects from i equals 1 to n is equal to this object here. So n number of integrals there, n number of definite integrals. <coughs> Here's 
here f of xi is this object here now, so this is the n-dimensional case, or it could be written like this. Okay, next step. Okay, let's how does this apply to manifolds? So we've got some manifold here, and just let this sphere here, the surface of this sphere just represent manifolds in general, just as an example, something for us to visualize. Um, and we have a manifold here with some set U defined on that manifold, manifold an open set, endpoints here, edges not included. So an open set on, on this manifold. And we have some map phi, which maps the open set U to the open set phi, which is in Euclidean space Rn. So whatever dimension we're in here, this is this mapping phi maps the open set U to the open set V. Okay, and so this point P in U becomes 5P under this mapping, and this point Q becomes 5Q under the mapping. Now for the point P belongs to U, its image, 5P under this map, are called the coordinates of P, and the individual XI in 5P, that's XI equals X1 to Xn for the N dimensions, are called coordinate functions. So these are the coordinate functions, these xi, each of the individual ones, x1, x2, x3, all the way up to xn, are the coordinate functions, for which xi equals xi of 5p. And we put the 5p here to show that it's this point p under the mapping phi. Okay? A different map will give us a different xi. So this map under phi, which maps n-dimensional space to the reals. So each of these coordinate functions maps the main dimensional space here to the number line, to the real number line. So it's a mapping from n-dimensional space to one-dimensional space. From n-dimensions to the scalar. <coughs> Alright, now let f, our function, be defined on the manifold. Um, and it's going to map, so f will be a function that maps from the manifold to the reals. Uh, so it takes points on the manifold and maps them to the real number line via smooth function on M. And let U subscript alpha phi subscript alpha be a chart of some atlas. If you remember from previous videos, an atlas is made up of a number of these charts. And with U alpha, the set U alpha, this one here, is now contained in the domain of F. So this set is contained within the domain of this uh, function, smooth function, which is defined on the manifold. All right, then f hat is f composed of phi alpha inverse, and that maps phi alpha of u alpha, that's this set here, into the reals, and is a real valued function on Rn. And f is said to be long to the class of infinitely number of times differentiable functions if f hat is also similarly a function that is infinitely differentiable a number of times. So if this belongs to the class of C infinity, then so does this belong to C infinity, which is the class of functions that are infinitely number of times differentiable. Now if you think of um, <clears throat> this point here, phi of uh, u alpha, any point in here, then the inverse mapping here, phi inverse, takes us from this set back to this set. And so that is the domain um, that F uses to map from the manifold to the reals. So this is a mapping from uh, into the reals, right? from this set in Rn into the reals. So it's a real value function on Rn, and it maps points in here to the real number line. All right? um, so just if you're a little bit happy with that, so F hat will be on this set. And f is the original function defined on the manifold. Then under this map, what does this look like over here in Euclidean n-dimensional Euclidean space? Right. And that's what we're looking at here. So just as this exists here, then the idea of this mapping here is that locally any point on the manifold locally looks Euclidean, hence the map. So that's, that's behind the fundamental definition of a manifold. At the heart of the definition of a manifold is that pick any point on the manifold, and that local to that point, the space around it looks like a, uh, a uh, Euclidean space of the same dimension. Right? So if you've got a function defined on a manifold, 
then you would expect that there's also going to be, when you map it across under this mapping, that there will be a function on n-dimensional Euclidean space. All right, so phi inverse takes us from this set back here. So phi inverse there, f composed of phi inverse, all right, maps this to the real uh, number line. In other words, f hat maps this set here, phi alpha of u alpha, to the real numbers. Okay, I'll probably stress that point enough times now. So we'll move on. All right, now set the coordinates of P to be phi alpha of P equals AI, uh, and that's going to be equal to A1 all the way up to AN, and we're going to let XI, the coordinate functions, the individual coordinate function, be phi alpha of the point Q, be a point contained within some open ball of radius mod A is contained uh, within phi alpha of U alpha. Now, in a neighborhood of AI, we can express, remember with the AI here and the XI, we're in Euclidean space, remember, we belong to this set here, which was in the n-dimensional Euclidean space. Hence, in a neighborhood of AI, we can express F hat according to Hadamard as F hat of XI minus F hat of AI is XI minus AI, remember that's sum from I equals 1 to N, times each of these individual functions here. Now, or we can write f hat of xi equals f hat of ai minus, I'm just expanding out the brackets here. So we can write it that way. Now what we want to do is take this last line here, last equation here, and we want to differentiate through on both sides with respect to the uh, variable xj. And we'll see that next. And what that gives us is df hat of dxj. Now, differentiating through with respect to xj. And remember the product rule applies from previously, so we have the derivative of xi times that plus xi times the derivative of that minus the derivative of ai with respect to xj times the function fi minus ai times the derivative of the function with respect to xj. Alright, now here this is the derivative of a constant, so that's going to disappear. And this will, this term here will also disappear because the evaluated AI, you have a constant, and the derivative of the constant will be zero. And so we're left with just the first term here. And over here, these are coordinate functions, so Kronika delta will apply here, so here it is, delta ij, delta ij, okay. And then we'll be left with this term and this term. Okay, looking down here now, evaluate the Kronika delta, so the uh, sum over the i's here, they become j, we get j here, and well, we contract the i's to get the j, and we get this object here minus this object, and we can rewrite that as, on the left hand side, unchanged here, and then on the right hand side we can factorise out this common term, and we get something looking like this. Now, what happens when xi approaches ai? When that happens, when this x approaches that, this term drops out, and the xi goes to a here. And what we end up with is the derivative of the original function on the Euclidean space Rn, f hat, with respect to the derivative of that with respect to xj, just gives us each of these individual functions here. All right, next step. Now, we're going to set the coordinate function xi equal to xi of phi of the point q under the map uh, phi alpha. Okay, we'll get that. And ai will be the point p. So the point p on the uh, manifold will have coordinates ai in Euclidean space, and the point q on the manifold will have coordinates xi in Euclidean space. And then we have f hat is f composed of phi inverse alpha. But now if we uh, compose both sides with respect to phi alpha, the original map, then these two here, inverse of each other, undo each other, we're left with the original function on the manifold f is f hat composed of phi alpha. So we have um, Hadamard on Euclidean space in Rn can be expressed this way. All right. Now if we, with this map, go back to the manifold, then on the manifold, the original function f can be expressed as f at the point q, evaluate the point q is equal to f evaluate the point p, plus x minus a, 
there's your name, times fj of q. And the other thing we've noticed is that as a uh, as x approaches a, then q approaches p, and as q approaches p, what we found earlier on the previous page, fj, the individual functions j of p, uh, is equal to the derivative with respect to xj of the original function at p. And we'll use that in the next video for the idea of a tangent space. Alright, so that's Hadamard and how it applies to manifolds. And we're done.